purpose of this video is to introduce the idea of discrete time signals and systems. Um, I'm going to do this by assuming that you already have some exposure to an understanding of continuous time signals and systems and uh, then contrast the uh, uh, continuous time signals and systems with discrete time signals and systems. So over here we'll have continuous and uh, let's see what's an appropriate discrete color. We'll have discrete. Okay, so um, you're familiar with the idea that continuous time systems we think of as an x with a, it's a function of t, and we plot that typically as some function of this continuous variable t. Okay, a discrete time system, on the other hand, we denote as x which is a function of n, where n is an integer. It's not a real valued, it's not a real valued uh, variable, but it's an integer. So this has some really interesting ramifications. So if I plot a discrete time signal, uh, what I tend to do is say, well, it has a value at 0. It has another value at 1, another value at 2, a value at 3, a value at 4, and so on. So this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And um, we usually use plots that look like this. Uh, to represent our discrete signals uh, for reasons that are not clear to me, but uh, I'm assuming uh, it made sense in the past. Each of these little guys has a little round head on it, and then it stands up on on, a, on an actual stem that's drawn, and uh, that's just culturally the way we do it. So. Um, that illustrates then the biggest difference between a continuous time signal and a discrete time signal. If I have here values of 1, 2, 3, 4, and I were to ask you what's the value of this signal at 1.5? You could look at the graph or you could figure out what the signal is and you could say, well, the value of this signal is whatever it is. Um, and it doesn't matter what number I give you between 1 and 2 you'd be able to tell me the value of the signal x of t because it's defined for all possible values between 1 and 2. On the other hand, if I come over here and ask you what's the value of this signal between 1 or at 1.5, you would not be able to tell me because this signal only has values defined at 1 and 2. So anywhere between 1 and 2, there is no value defined for a discrete time or for this discrete time signal. So um, that's the difference. Uh, discrete time signals have values only at integer points. Um, so why should you care? Why, why don't we just always do everything in terms of continuous time signals? Well, it turns out there's a couple reasons. Um, you probably are thinking, well, the world is continuous. Uh, I have voltages that uh, vary continuously over time. I have sound waves that vary continuously over time. I have positions and velocities that vary continuously over time, which is true. Why do I even need discrete time signals? There's a couple reasons. One, which is becoming more and more important, is that discrete time signals occur from sampling continuous time signals. That's a terrible abbreviation. So the idea is that I might actually look at this signal at time 1, at time 2, time 3, and time 4, and take these samples and have that be then my discrete time signal. 
Why would I want to do that? It turns out that computers are very good at uh, working with uh, discrete time signals. You can't really use a computer, at least a digital computer of the type we have today, to uh, work with continuous time signals. So all of the great advances that we've had in media, so for example, uh, uh, MPEG, uh, MP3 files, uh, digital video, all of that is due to the idea that I've taken uh, continuous sound signals, sampled them, and then actually done a lot more stuff to create discrete signals that I can use. Other times, you may actually have a signal that is really discrete. So, for example, um, if there is uh, one example that's used quite often, which doesn't make the best sense to me anymore, but I'll give it anyway, is the idea of the stock market. It used to be, back before the days that you could get instant updates on the market prices and, and so on uh, through uh, the web, that typically people looked at just the closing value of the stock market. So, for example, I might look at the value of HP stock at the end of every day, or I might look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average at the end of every day. And so that stock value at the end of every day, so at the end of day zero I'd have a particular value, at the end of day one I'd have a particular value, and at the end of day two I'd have a particular value, and so on. So by just looking at the value at the v end of every day, then it doesn't make sense to later on say, well, what was the value at 1 o'clock? Because all I have is the data at the end of every day. This is a, um, this is a uh, uh, signal that is inherently discrete. Um, there are some other differences, or a lot of differences then show up in terms of how I represent signals and systems uh, in continuous time uh, signals and systems, I oftentimes will represent a system by a differential equation. Okay. For a discrete time uh, system, I typically represent, or I can represent the dynamics of that system by what's called a, a difference equation. Okay. And related to that, in continuous time um, in continuous time systems I have uh, derivatives and I have integrals. In discrete time systems, I have differences, and I have sums. Okay. In um, continuous time systems, I do analysis on them uh, to understand their dynamics if they're linear and time invariant using Laplace transforms. In discrete time systems, I use what's called the Z-transform. And uh, uh, Z-transforms actually look a lot like Laplace transforms, but there are some important and uh, sometimes subtle differences. To do frequency domain analysis, I typically use Fourier transforms. And in discrete signals and systems, I use discrete Fourier transforms. So I'm just going to abbreviate that because I'm getting writer's cramp. So um, the most fundamental idea to remember you know, about discrete time signals and systems is that in a discrete time signal, there are only values at integer points in time. OK, so with discrete signals, I can do the sorts of things that we've been looking at for continuous time signals. So I can take a signal x and add 
a signal y if I wanted to. I can multiply a signal by some constant a. I could multiply a signal x by a signal y. So there's all these things that we're, uh, if you've already seen uh, continuous time signals, there's all these things we're used to doing that we can still do. Um, so that pretty much ends the introduction to discrete time signals and systems.